Okay, there's a question we want to ask today. Is Christianity worth it? From Psalm 73, a bizarre kind of story to introduce that. In January 2004, a 66-ton whale died and was beached on the southwestern coast of, uh, of Taiwan near the city of Tainan. Two weeks later, the authorities decided to truck the dead whale to a laboratory where they could do an autopsy. And it took 50 laborers and three lifting cranes 13 hours to hoist this 56 foot whale onto a flatbed trailer truck. And pedestrians and shop owners poured into the streets to watch the spectacle of this whale carcass being driven through the streets of downtown Tainan. And then it happened. As the truck crawled along, the whale exploded. That's right, it literally blew up. The inner conditions of the dead mammal, combined with the bumps in the road, and for like the roads in our city, they all know what that's all about, caused an eruption that the townspeople will not soon forget. Cars and people and local shops were splattered with whales entrails. Traffic was brought to a halt for hours and the smell was almost unbearable. Now isn't that just like life sometimes? You're going about your business and all is well and suddenly a whale explodes. Life has a way of suddenly altering its course down hard paths, leaving us hurt and confused with lots of unanswered questions. You didn't see it coming, you didn't plan for it, but it happened nonetheless. Life isn't fair. I'm sure that you've either said that, or you've thought that, or you've heard somebody else say that before. And it's true, life doesn't seem to be fair. We see injustice on a daily basis. Innocent people attacked and killed while the killers themselves either either kill themselves or get such an inadequate custodial uh, sentence to make us despair of the judicial system. We see good people getting terminal illnesses while those not having a care or a consideration for others, well, they seem to stay healthy. We see the rich and the famous enjoying the trappings of luxury, holidaying and and spending money like there was no tomorrow, while the rest of us struggle along to try and make ends meet. And on top of that, it, it, it often seems that Christians have the worst of it. You walk into any church and you can find a whole prayer list of people who are ill or needing employment or struggling in a relationship or finding it hard to keep going in the Christian faith, where non-Christian friends seem to have such an easy time of it. In other lands, we read of Christians persecuted to their deaths by cruel and godless men. Yes, life doesn't seem fair. Is Christianity worth it? Well, that could be the title for the first half of Psalm 73 that we read together. This was how Asaph, the author, was feeling when he started to write this psalm. He was a mature, a godly man who served as a worship leader in the temple and was the author of actually 12 of the 150 psalms. Yet here he is ready to give up his faith, to walk away from God. And with great honesty, he asks the question, many of us have perhaps asked from time to time, why are the wicked successful while the righteous suffer? We want to look at verse 3, we want to measure on verse 3 first of all. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. See, Asaph had been looking and watching how the ungodly were getting along, and what he saw concerned him. To get insight into Asaph's struggle here, we want to notice four key words from this verse. Two of these words refer to the people that he had been tracking and and, and looking at. The other words, arrogant and wicked. The word arrogant comes from a, a root word meaning 
a loud noise. An arrogant person is therefore one who blows his own trumpet. They are people who make sure that others notice them and what they have. They make sure the cameras are clicking and the interviewers are there to fawn over them. Wicked, of course, emphasizes the guilt of those who are actively choosing that which is offensive to God. The third word we need to see from this verse became really a private obsession with Asaph. It was the prosperity these God rejectors enjoyed. The Hebrew word for prosperity is shalom. It literally means peace with God so that your life is fulfilled and tranquil and complete. And Asaph looked at the lifestyles of those around him, the clothing, the houses they lived in, the company they kept, and he thought to himself, they're getting everything that God promised to his covenant people. I, I, I try to live the right way, but it seems that they are blessed and not me. I thought you reap what you sow, God, but I'm getting a raw deal here. See, Asaph had fallen into the trap of loving the world and the things that are in the world. He ceased being concerned about the sin of the successful and started focusing instead on the success of the sinful. And that led us, led us to the fourth word we need to see in this first verse, verse three, the word envy. Envy is the tendency to compare yourself with someone else in a way that leaves you feeling deprived. Envy means I want what you have. And Asaph was eaten up with it. Not difficult for that to happen. Envy is so common that God made it one of the, the subjects of one of his ten commandments. You know the one that starts, do not cover your neighbor's house, etc. And Asaph had let envy in at the door. And now it seemed to colour everything that he saw. So as we go down this passage in verses 4 and 5, Asaph wonders why life seems so good for those who want to have nothing to do with God. They have no struggles, their bodies are healthy and strong, etc. They live life in the fast lane and they don't seem to burn or to crash. Their life appears, appears to be painless and easy. And Asaph looks even closer. He sees why the unbeliever thinks he has no need of God. Verses 6 to 12, they seem to be doing just fine without him. Verse 7 says they have no limits. Their evil imaginations, it says, has no limits. They have all the time, money and influence to do whatever they want. They make fun of believers in verse 8, scoffing, speaking with malice. They even speak against God in verses 9 and 11. Look at verse 11. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Derision in the face of God. Verse 12 gives us a, a kind of summary of what the wicked are like. They're always free of care. They increase in wealth. And it's easy to be jealous of those who seem to be able to live life without any boundaries and seem to have everything. We all have our celebrity heroes and wish just a little of the fame and fortune would come our way. And so in verse 13, Asaph kind of sums this up and he says, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in, in innocent. He seems to be basically believing that there's no advantage to holy living. But remember, he's still looking at things from a human perspective. Living Bible puts, this, puts that verse this way. Have I been wasting my time? Why take the trouble to be pure? Such is Asaph's mindset, but that by the time we reach verse 14, he is filled with turmoil, confusion, and despondency. All day long I've been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishment. Now human nature is still the same as it was in Asaph's day, so it is in our day. And to make it worse for us, some of the people who seem to be above us somehow aren't very even nice people. 
Some of them are jerks. Some of them are cheats. Some of them are outright scoundrels and even scumbags. And yet they seem to be doing just fine. It's galling enough to have to share space on the planet with disreputable people. But sometimes we have to work with them. We go to school with them. We socialize with them. We take orders from them. We serve on committees with them. And sometimes we live next door to them. And all in all, life can be frustrating. To feel that you've been passed by unworthy people in the great race of life. Try to honor God and stay humble and do good. You'll have a a rough deal. Live by lust and power and greed and deceit and you'll become a celebrity. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. In vain I've washed my hands in innocence. Can you connect with any of these feelings? Do you ever think to yourself, does it pay to serve God? I try to be faithful and, uh, and do right, but life is a struggle. Why do dictators and child molesters and corporations get off easy? Why do God-mocking people get their own TV shows? Why is God blessing them instead of judging them? And if we really are God's people who try, however vainly, however clumsily, to do his will, if he really does love us like he says he does, why does he let the bad guys away with murder and the good guys have to take it on the chin? But before you bail out on God, Asaph wants you to know that that isn't the end of his psalm. He wants you to sit with him and learn from his experiences. He has more to say than just reflect on how things are and just complain. God is big enough to take your anger, your pain and your questions. So so what does Asaph do? Well, first of all, bizarrely, he keeps quiet. In verses 12 to 14, Asaph's envy had so eaten him up that he was fed up living a godly life. He was angry and disillusioned. But in verse 15, he stops to consider the impact of just what his next step might be. He says, if I have said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. He remembers that he is still part of the community of faith. And talking about his doubts in this way would have done more harm than good. So Asaph realized that if he went public with his inner struggle and his his cynicism and his anger out in words, he'd become a tool for Satan to use just for the, the ruin, for the discouragement of God's people. So he chooses to keep quiet. And sometimes just exercising faith in that quiet way is our best option. We need to realize that most of the time we won't understand why things happen the way they do. Why does one person die, another live? Why does one scoundrel get rich and some of the godly people suffer with poverty? Why did that tornado destroy that home but leave the other one unscathed? Why did that man not get caught cheating And another man who plays by the rules loses his job. These questions and a million more like it will never be fully answered this side of heaven. And so Asaph kept quiet. And that was all very admirable, but it didn't really solve his dilemma. He tried to rationalize things, but keeping things inside only made him wanted to explode. He was miserable because he couldn't talk to others and complaining didn't seem to be the godly response. So next he looks at the big picture. And this is where Asaph's perspective is expanded. And he comes to verse 17. Um, Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. You see, Asaph went to church. He brought his his confusion under the truth of God. As long as Asaph tried to reason his way out of his troubled perception apart from God, he would just hit his head against a brick wall. It was oppressive to me, he said. The envy he had of the wicked was like blinkers to his eyes. All he could see was their immediate pleasure. And now he has this this breakthrough moment when his human perspective of life is reframed by looking instead at heaven's 
viewpoint. If the first section of the, of the psalm deals with the trial of faith, the last part addresses the triumph of faith. So what is it that changes everything for Asaph? The same thing that will transform our perspective. That is entering the presence of God. God's point of view is understood when we meet with him, when we're reminded of his attributes, his character, his power. We see both God's judgment on sin as well as his solution offered to sinners. It was only in the sanctuary of God that Asaph could understand the precarious predicament of the wicked and the sweetness of God's grace and mercy. Those attributes of grace and mercy we see in Jesus going to the cross to die for all those injustices which are so real to us. In the sanctuary, God was his focus, not his problems. Eternity broke into his temporal perspective. For in God's presence, we see things differently. When we meet together, when we sing and when we pray, when we listen to God's word being read and explained, suddenly the world's values seem so hollow and not worth striving to obtain. And so verses 17 through to 19 show us that Asaph now sees things differently. He says, now, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Their prosperity is only temporary. They enjoy their sin for a time, perhaps from a human perspective, even for a lifetime. But from the perspective of eternity, how short is that prosperity? And Asaph realizes that the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God and the woman who does the man of God lives forever. God completely controls their destiny, not them. And their end will be terrible for those who do not believe in God. And when we look at the life of folks who have nothing except the things of this world, when we look to the eyes of eternity, we see, through, see, see three things. First of all, we see the ruin of the wicked. Asaph's reality is reframed as he's finally able to see that God has placed the wicked on very slippery ground. Early he felt like he was sliding away, but now he recognizes it is the unbelievers who are slipping. How suddenly they are destroyed, he says in verse 19. So instead of jealousy, longing for the things people have, we should have a real concern about their final destiny. Verse 20 warns us that they are just merely living a dream, a fantasy that will eventually turn into a nightmare. We sometimes forget that judgment of God is real and eternity is forever. We often prefer to sugarcoat that fact. Well, like the family whose ancestors came to America on the Mayflower and were now proudly compiling a family history and they were not sure what to say about a great uncle who had been executed in the electric chair. The author thought that he said he will take care of everything in the, and when the book came out it read, Great Uncle George occupied a chair of applied electronics. At an important government institution, he was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. <laughs> we can rewrite the truth of history, can't we? But we can't rewrite what God has said. We can't whitewash the reality of God's judgment, of the everlasting punishment of those who do not put their faith and trust in him. And maybe sometimes our evangelism loses sight of that emphasis. God's message is, why? Why would you envy the wicked? They are in grave danger. They don't know it. They don't see it. But God has spoken and his word cannot be broken. For the, for the moment, the wicked seem to have it good, but soon enough, judgment day will come. 
And we can say three things about their ultimate destiny. First, their judgment is sudden and unexpected. Then their destruction is complete and irreversible. And thirdly, God's wrath is personal and inescapable. Are you trusting on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as your only hope of avoiding this deserved judgment? Secondly, the repentance of the righteous. In verses 21 and 22, Asaph owns up for his myopic vision. He calls himself senseless and ignorance, a brute beast before you. His spirit had been bitter. When he wanted what the wicked had, he was eaten up on the inside. And with great honesty, he here describes his behavior as that of an animal. And he uses the term for a, for a grazing animal, that, like a cow that just lives with his head hunched, seeing only the grass and never looking up at the sky. And he compares to it to himself, viewing things only from a human perspective. One thing that separates us from the animal kingdom is that animals cannot contemplate the future. They live only in the present. And when Asaph only looked at the here and now, he was like an animal that had no concept of eternal realities. And thirdly, a vision of the future. He gains a new view of God. Asaph looks forward to a day when he will be with the Lord forever. In the future, he says, you will take me up to glory. What do unbelievers have that can possibly match that? What can equal the personal presence of God himself? How much is it worth it to know that someday you will be with the Lord in glory? The wealth of the wicked means nothing. With God, we have everything. No matter the outward circumstances of our lives, it is a great, a wonderful thing to be a Christian when you die. For if you know Jesus, the best is yet to come. So do you envy the unbeliever? How foolish it is to do that. How short-sighted. They are like chaff, chaff, blown by the wind. Let them have their trinkets and their baubles. Let them have their short moment in the sun. For the unbeliever, this earth is the only heaven they will ever know. And for the, for the believer, this earth is the only hell they will ever endure. In the end, we will discover that nothing on earth or in heaven is more desirable than God. We may die, but even death itself cannot sever our relationship with God, with him in glory. No one can take that away from those that trust in him. To borrow a phrase from Jonathan Edwards, no, not the triple jumper, the godly have a better portion, even though all they have is God. So by the time verse 25 is reached, Asaph is finally where God has always wanted him to be. When he says, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. I wonder if we can honestly say that this is our perspective. Is our perspective more human than heavenly? Until we reach the point of saying, God, you're all I want because you're all I need, then we're gonna wonder why life doesn't seem fair. Is God all that you want? No matter what happens to you or what you see in others, are you satisfied in God? And that's a very big question which causes us to do a whole lot of soul searching but Asaph knew that nothing was more valuable than what he already had. He could say in verse 26 that no matter what happens to him, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. When he, while his present needs are taken care of through God's faithful provision, his eternal inheritance is rock solid because God himself is his portion. The prophet Habakkuk had the same attitude. Though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And so Asaph concludes by saying that he fulfills 
two key responsibilities that come to each believer. First, he says he will stay near to God. Verse 26, God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. And since happiness is only to be found in a close relationship with God, it only makes sense to get as close to him as possible. Asaph has learned firsthand that the greater our nearness to God, the less we will be affected by the, the attractions and the distractions around us. And then our second responsibility is to tell others about God. We see this in the very last phrase of the psalm, I will tell of all your deeds. Before Asaph worst worst it, he concluded it wasn't even worth following God. He was filled with envy, decided not to tell other, other about his doubts. And as long as he was discontented with God, he could say nothing at all. For envy is the enemy of evangelism. But now in the second half of the psalm, he reaches a different conclusion. Once he sees the ultimate destination of the wicked, he no longer craves what they have. And now he can speak. Could it be that often we don't tell others about Jesus because, not because we don't know how to, but because we don't really believe that what we have is better than what they have. Worldliness is devastating to our witness because we secretly desire to be more like lost people than we desire that they be like us. And if we're honest, is that not sadly true? One of the best motivations for evangelism is to come into the presence of God and allow him to shift your mindset. Think of the people you work with. Think of your relatives, your neighbours, your friends who don't know Jesus. When our perspective shifts from our human understanding to the reality of eternity, then their destiny will be vitally important to us. We will want to tell of his deeds. If you want that right attitude of heart, you don't get it by watching the news or American Idol. You won't get that in the great universities of the world. Cambridge and Oxford can't teach you. If you want that right attitude, you need to go into the presence of God. And if we are trusting Christ for salvation, we belong to him. We are not like the world. We belong to Christ. That is why we exist. This is why, this is what we believe. This is how we live. And because the pressure of the world is so constantly with us, we must use every opportunity in worship to do for us what worship did for Asaph. It brought him back to his senses. It helped him see what he had missed. And so let's draw some simple conclusions and then we're done. One, in this life the wicked sometimes prosper while the righteous seem to take it on the chin. Two, as long as we play the comparison game, our lives will be filled with envy and anger and frustration. Three, those who forget God in this life will one day discover that all they live for will be suddenly and utterly destroyed. Four, those who cling to God in times of confusion will find that he is more than enough for this life and the life to come. Five, the salvation brought by Jesus on the cross is sufficient to make us right with God. And six, God gives us his guiding hand through difficulties in the knowledge that things are, are only going to get better for those who love the Lord. And so Psalm 73 reminds us that sometimes we may feel our faith slipping away. Have we stopped believing? Sadly, there are some that have. Faith chooses to believe that Jesus is Lord over every part of our life, even the parts that make no sense at the moment. So make him your rock, make him your firm foundation, and you will never be swept away. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honesty of the Psalms that just reflect life in all its many dimensions. We thank you for Asaph, who looked at the world and was envious of it. We thank you, Lord, that when he came into your presence, your Holy Spirit was able to change things for him. He was able to see things as a right perspective. He was able to be concerned about their eternal destiny and not envious of the way they lived. Father, help us to learn from this. The world is so present with us day by day, and sometimes we do get envious 
of what others have. Father, just help us to see things through the eyes of the Lord Jesus, to realize that you are all that we need, and we just ask that you are all that we, all that we want. We ask that we will not look at the world and be envious of it, but we will put our faith and trust in you, that we will walk with you, that we will be examples for you, that we will be witnesses for you to show people that there is a better way, a way in following you. So help us and speak to our hearts, we pray this morning, in the name of Jesus. Amen.